Okay, so before we start taking other takes seriously, ask yourself this. Do any of these other people own a iced out chow necklace? No. No, I don't think so. So, this is why I will be doing the top five reasons as to why Sonic Frontiers is the best Sonic game ever made. <laughs> So Sonic has always been smoking the competition. From Prince Banana 2 and 400 Jogos to the Sonic PSP. Does Mario have his own PSP? I think not. Hence why position number 5 is Sonic does what the rest don't. I mean, Sega was out here dropping adult games on Saturn with 3 million dollar budgets. They cannot be messed with. The late bloomer boomer Mario on a beach chair in 2017. The visionary Gex on a beach chair back in 1998. The legendary Spyro on a beach chair in 99, and Banjo-Kazooie on a beach chair also in 98. But who, who I say, was there first? Why it is this, Gallant Hedgehog in 94 at Asu. Oh, of course, nothing exists in a vacuum and where Sonic may have invented gaming, he did, for one, have Bubsy and Momentum. And for two, the dandy in the room here with Frontiers is that it is very obviously, clearly, and blatantly taking after Death Stranding. The weird arcane tools used for traversal, the rainy green lands, the mountain scaling, the fact that your friends are all holograms. I'm just glad that it didn't give Sonic a realistic human baby to deal with, because the implications of that would be fucking horrific. That said though, DS was rather awkward to control, slow as heck, and so Sonic takes his patented gotta go blast processing to make this game type actually playable. I mean, look at him go! Zoom in right up those mountains like it's nothing. Hey, uh, a Sonic bust, eh? Huh. Maybe they should release a Rouge bust. What is genuinely, non-jokingly really interesting is how the platformer game design influences and aids the open world design. For example, breadcrumbing. Crash, Mario, Spyro all very often use collectibles to guide the player towards a secret or to highlight optimal jumping arcs or just to display a point of interest. Suppose you could argue that the wider collectathon maps were always in essence mini open worlds, but it's still really neat to see it applied here in such a manner. The land automatically ain't sparse, and traversal isn't instantly exclusively that, especially with how it lets Sonic's level design play into it too, unlocking more and more stretches of high-speed guardrail across the map as one explores, making it very easy to get back to certain places quickly, and in a way that's much way and hella more fun than plucking a fast travel option from a map or menu. Same way, it's little platforming challenges and the like that open up the prior or just to get you goody shit all over the repetitive if not engaged tower climbing of the Ubisofts. Granted, I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't a bit overwhelmed at times with just how much every single square inch is used for some type of jump blasty purpose, but in that I did keep getting distracted and roped into things never not being entertained. No shortages of points of interest is what I'm saying. Whether it be seeing what's up there, or figuring out how to get up there, or fighting this weird thing, or going to a thing and finding out that it's a thing to fight, it's not so much a gameplay loop as it is a gameplay framework gun nutting the fuck off in every fucking direction in an array of sparkles and colors and wonderment. Which, <laughs> not gonna lie, actually negates a lot of design issues the hog has struggled with since day one. Like facilitating levels for speed, being worried that set levels or the game in general are too short, lack in variety or being too padded, all his very core struggles that did not make Sonic chuckle. But having this big playground with things portaling off into either shorter traditional stages that are meant to be played several times and the exploring discovery vibes that might make one want to take it slow, all congealing together with a unlocking X by collecting Y system, it just makes all components gel in a way that they haven't ever really. SA1 comes closest, but this works out more smoothly in my opinion. Frontiers are essentially Sonic Adventure slash 06 slash Unleashed Townified and Collectathon Levelified and 2D Sonician Physics Playgroundy Exploringified, the open world game, and that's baller ass. <laughs> Sega legend and director, a Sonic CD and longtime artist for Sonic, Balan, Knights and Blinks, Naoto Oshima once formed his own studio called Artoon, where he produced the hit horror game Vampire Rain. And just look at the rain detail in this. 
on the roads, the walls, and especially the character models. How detailed and realistic it all looks. A real artist's eye. So, naturally, here in Frontier, shit looks stank-ass with not but these little white particles jittering about. That's because the jank. Sonic's gotta have the jank. Ooh, yes. <laughs> yes! So got that boost gameplay smell about it too. That great when you know what you're doing and have played this level a few times, but sometimes really disorientating and wow if you don't vibe. But I like that. I like seeing people break levels and clear them in seconds by abusing the trademark Buckwald physics the hog has always been about. And with the ease of replayability being present far more than ever, if not essential to the actual gameplay loop, knowing what you're doing has never been this easy. But as of course, there are still times where the light speed dash won't connect right, or the physics launch you up in a way that feels unintended, or the camera goes a bit burr, either getting stuck on some shit or redirecting awkwardly. The spirit of adventure is still alive and well. Fuck what it play like. This some shit from 06. Oh shit. Sega. Sega, is this, is this a goddamn Sega Golf Trees reference? But I personally don't mind, as the rest is cohesive and polished enough to make up for it, far as I'm concerned. Nor did I ever really care to begin with, to be honest. I love 06. I made a whole damn video about it. Watch it if you haven't, bitch. It's fucking great. But I'd be lying if I said that this wasn't easily the most jankless Sonic in a hot minute, which says a lot, given how many things it tries. Like, yeah, sure, maybe Generations was less jank in some ways, but that game is also safe-ass, all things considered. And Sonic, he's spiky for a reason. Edgy, even. So I prefer it when he's not safe, even if the edge is rough. Sonic came around it like Mario. We need that yin and yang, blue and red, rounds and edges. So I'm very glad that they're back. That said, however, this is a Sonic game where wall runs can be executed from boosts or out of nothing or do jumps from rails to grinds reliably most of the time, which is doubly expressive, again, given the size. This is by far and away the best a boy has ever controlled. It all feels so viscerally fast and hard as fuck, visually engaging, orally epic and kinesthetically solid, which makes all the number five shit all the more funner to fuck with, too. Also, uh, it, it, it's nice to see the weird latexy texture from O6 still being alive and well, too. None of that, he's just blue bullshit. Give me them creases! Well, hey. At least they're vegan. That's because Sonic the Hedgehog cares about your health. The curry may have nearly killed me, but I at least could relax afterwards with my Sonic stress ball. He wants you to be able to vibe out, whether that's in the Fresh Prince era Will Smith fits looking ass level art of Chaotix, or while Frontierin here in the immaculately made worlds with incredible music says this game is a fucking vibe. vibe. There's just these perfect little moments, like when I noticed enemies leaving imprints in the sand, as did my foots, and then the music hit. Gazing out across the faded hot horizon, marveling at the detailed sand, all the activities and points of interest that surrounded me as sand kicked up as I proceeded to run towards. I love this area. Nice little oasis. Uh, uh, o oasis I? Oasis. And the flatness made it easier to oversee. I got my bearings hella fast, which made filling in every detail mental mappily gradually all the more rewarding. Fitting as well, coming from the first area's more woe new world confusion, Sonic's got a handle on shit now, and so did I. It's great stuff. But yeah, while I can get that some folks may find the more realistic landscapes to be a bit uninspired, the reuse of boost level assets certainly is god fucking damn. I genuinely adore what Frontiers is putting down aesthetically. We still got bold usages of color. We got fucking footwork music. God damn, I, I never thought I'd hear anything like this in a AAA game. This shit's fucking nuts, dog. Holy shit. The dreaded E had hit them both rather different in the club scene. And while we made fun of the rain a little earlier, this is still such a nice vibe to start off with. This somber lost isekai hedgehog. 
in a far off unknown land, quietly exploring. Not a vibe we really ever had in Sonic before, and I appreciate it due to that. And man. Shout out to his little footsie pitter patters going mad on this wet, mushy grass. Adding to the little smances of it all for days. Would you like to try? I'll let you borrow a rod. The fishing mini game with Big is also perfect. The smooth jazz, the general ease of control, Big encouraging you like an awkward and distant yet well meaning stepdad. The fact that Treasures is catchable as our classic Sonic attributes, it's, it's not hard, not deep, but just the whole vibe of it owns. Sonic says, eh, I guess it wouldn't hurt to detense for a second. Which is exactly what you do. And just like with the map design side games, it's fucking disgusting how I never got the same thing twice. Like that honestly makes this the best fishing minigame ever. There's none of that, aw oh, no, not this again bullshit. And also I'm gonna give one big fat shout out to the pinball moment with the goddamn outrun music. I don't care what people say. Writing wise, Forces was a return to form. I fuck that hokey jokey self aware shit from the post unleashed games. I want my Sonic dumb, emotional, and full of over the top anime bullshit. I want the edge. And Frontiers continues that bigly. Even before the game dropped, dropping this super clenched fist crying, hopefully looking up at the skying type theme, and a fucking little micro OVA about Snuckles. My boy, my friend, my homie. Also, wow, Amy's actually cool. In this awesome ditzy dumbass only obsessed with Sonic who hates her, they actually seem like really good friends, and she like you know does stuff and has opinions and thoughts and shit. Ooh, she's a character now. I must say this could be due to Frontiers having some of the Sonic comic writers on board. I don't read them, but I know folks who do, and whenever I see bits of Amy from those, she's always dripped out to shit and ball her ass, and they look very stylized and dramatic too, which is also very noticeable in the storytelling here in Frontiers. I mean Sonic and Suckles have this little late Vegeta bro rivalry vibe going on, which is also a huge improve on the preve as I sort of feel like Knuckles became a bit of a himbo meme and while funny, it ostensibly declawed him. This gives him his spunk back, his edge. Having him ruminate on his emerald guardianship, why he does it, if he should keep doing it, if he's even good at it, same way Amy talks about love and what it means to her. I really humanized these characters, which hasn't been a thing much at all since Adventure, if ever, and even even then it happened mostly only outside of the main cast. Silver and Blaze get to ponder, the robot gets to be sad in SA, Shadow gets to have his doubts, but Knuckles, Sonic, Amy, Tills, they were always just sort of their simple tropey characters, somewhat inconsistently at that too. So it's super nice to see such a conceited effort to really give them something to say and do or talk about. You know, other than Grr, Eggman or uh, the Chaos Emeralds, and which is still here too obviously, but still. Besides, by the time I was transforming into supersonic, beam struggling, flying, blowing shit the fuck up against giant robots that shoot lasers to melodramatic metal music, it was like, yeah! Sonic is fucking DBZ again, baby! He's anime again, the stakes is real, and the tears will drop. And as such, I also love this villain, this little kid with the red eyes and emo air. Ib as Hekka, deviant art tear. Dragon Guardian almost. She's fucking adorable. Uh, it's not the best Sonic game ever. Or at least, it's not my fave in any case. I don't even know how one would quantify best, nor would I care to. Fuck a value judgment. But I do like it a lot, and I think it's easily the easiest to like Sonic game in regards to the wider public in quite some time. I think Adventure is my actual favorite though. Though, although, however, as I said, SA1 comes closest, but this works out more smoothly in my opinion. 
I do love to, too, but I can't stand the Tails and Eggman stages, and O6 can certainly be very fucking frustrating at times, and at least has the collecting, unlocking shit, but shitty, and R I adore, but I mean, you know, that's a play for 40 minutes, smile and feel good about it type of game, and not a lose myself for several days, as I did in Frontiers type of game, which is also how I feel about most of the 2Ds, actually. Fun to play for a few hours until I run out of continues and go, hmm. <laughs> Sonic. So who knows? Maybe I do think it's best. Whatever the fuck that means to you. Suppose I have some little complaints like how annoyingly slow upgrading the speed and ring caps is, or how it sometimes locks you onto 2D planes when you don't want it to, despite that making the platforming as functional as it is. Not super keen on the boost stages reusing their themes again either. Fun as I find them to be, and sometimes the mini bosses can be a little obtrusive in the same way. Looking at you, squid. Uh, that's also pretty funny to be going on a casual walk sniffing flowers or whatever the fuck and suddenly bwah, squid has noticed you like yes yeah, 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 squid thank you i see you also but that's really it the combat feels fucking incredible the homing is honed in fine-tuned and perfected fat beef unlocking more shits as you go and before you know it you're chaining boosts into dodges into parries into projectiles and ah, da, 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 da. I actually realized what they attempted with Unleashed and made a super fucking satisfying Sonic beat em up that uses the exact same language and controls as the non combative play does. Super seamlessly integrated and great, cause yeah, I, I like this game. Sonic is still my friend. Sorry about the top 5 thing though, I, I, I don't like that type of content either, but I just figured I'd do something fun with this. I didn't want to write a flat out review per se, because I don't think Frontiers needs one. People know about it and tons of folks probably already have and will review it. Shout out Cybershell. That said, there's plenty of other games that came out during the past little while that I think do deserve a decent spotlight put on them. So let's do intro. Welcome to So I've Been Playing, the show where I talk about games and experiences I have experienced that I wasn't able to make fully fledged videos out of or repurpose otherwise. Cause, I mean, you know, only so much I can say about a free browser game, but goddamn is slowroads.io ever a chill one. It's a very old school sort of racer in the vein of test drive or outrun where as many people already do, it's probably more suited to being called a driving game instead of a racing game. One with a lovely aesthetic. Flat lighting, bold but still easy on the eyes color choices. Low on detail but not uncannily empty, nice crusty 2D greenery and flowers and a breathtakingly vast render distance. Pleasant really do be the term that comes to mind most for me. No music either, and the fact that it's an electric car also means that you aren't hit with a constant <coughs> breaking up the vibe. Changeable is the season, planet, time of day, but otherwise you're on your procedural way, having a good time, seeing what one can find, as you bullheadedly try to master the drift. Not even the only browser game I stumbled upon, neither. Yeah, I know. That's why we also have three days till harvest. And man, dog, speaking of lovely aesthetics, fucking modern day pre-renders, sharp, cripsy, photorealistic, reminiscing me of Bauda Elf, but applied far less uncannily and far more cozily, going for a PS1 JRPG look. Not what this is, though. As this is, though, actually a really cool murder mystery short story set upon a small town. It was made for a Halloween game jam, so it is super short, and Defo has some default of the soul going on, as well as a bit of jank, but on the whole, the whole vibe is still quite cute. It's a bit like the towny situations in a game like Golden Sun, but honed in on and set onto one to their own. Not that there isn't a smidge of adventure, as as those towns tend to go, they'll often have some surrounding areas needed traveling to do, and that's essentially what the gameplay is. The stuff in JRPGs that'll normally have battles built around it. Go to the forest to find some dust. Look for the three statues spread about the place, and so on. Fetch quests, essentially, but with solely the exploration and cuteness left to color them in. And I like that. In concept and in execution, simple though it is in this case. 
Thing is, as well, the world is designed pretty well. Areas are all compacted, and the locations of quest givers as opposed to items allow for curiously passing by things on your way to a place that'll then get colored in with more meaning or purpose at your destination. Backtracks brief and filled with rewarding intent and maps, despite their size, open enough to still sort of make it feel like you're doing more than nakedly moving between event triggers. Besides, most of my time in this 30 minutes long game was spent just admiring the details. Whether it be the world map, or the mossy grassy forest, or the gorgeous tree village, or something as otherwise innocuous as a tiny little bridge, they're all doused in picturesqueness accompanied by some snice music that I think is royally free. Not sure how I feel about this cave, however, but I'll just chalk it up as a reference to the poop world from Mario Kart 64. The photorealism and the lack of compression enhance the model table-like qualities that 2.5D games often have already, and it helps in making whatever details it wants you to pick up on to stick out more too. Again, very simple, very short, a little jank and goofy, but incredibly nice looking, and I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for whatever else the creator of this we'll be making in the future. As said, it isn't particularly scary at all for a Halloween game jam game, but luckily, I also have something else plenty spooky to show y'all too. But first... New game I done an OST for. Boom. Damn. A cool snatcher gameplay in but story and vibe in wholly different than adventure game by stuffed wombat of Pong fame. He made Pong. And he also made producer 2021. Play it bitch. It's really cool and unique and stuff. There's a bar in it that serves pickles and toast. Hell yeah. Oh my god. What is she doing? Dude, your fucking face! Now, I'm not gonna claim to be an expert on the Siren series, but it certainly has a vibe all its own, despite clearly having sprung from the spring Silent Hill 1 strung. It is a lot more obtuse, esoteric, and explicitly Japanese, hence why it likely never spawned much in the way of inspired buys, copycats, or even sequels, only having two, kinda. And yet, the goat, the god, and the legend of Let's Play himself, Slowbeef, and some buddies made exactly that. 
I don't think I could ever understate how much influence slow beef has had on my tastes as they developed and crystallized over the course of my late teens and early 20s through Red Supre, him doing fan translation work, and even his solo channel. From a fair few of the first few Japan only PS1 games I covered, the videos of which now inspiring fan translation efforts of their very own, to learning about games like Trag, Galarians, or even Danganronpa long before that blew the fuck up. Even if played or reacted to in jest, I still really grew to appreciate what I saw there, and so I'm very fucking excited to see what he done made with Atama. A first-person, siren-inspired horror game lit and shaded like a goddamn PS360 title. I mean, look at this beautifully wet shimmering. This shiny gate, reminiscent of the shiny road and the shiny grass and the shiny wood. Such a raw fucking atmosphere. This rustic, dark, deep red haze that permeates even into the excellently chosen font. Things off in the distance, simply silhouetted in red, yet at the same time most of the light sources emit a bleached white that bounces off of the many reflective surfaces. The fashion in which lights and shadows interact with shit feels inconsistent in a way that I really like, too. Makes for a lot of interesting play with shade, silhouetting, and visibility overall. Three big buildings, two foggishly whited out, one entirely darkened. A light lighting up a shadow as if a solid. Or the almost shadowless interiors. Overall, Atama has a faded grainy look, but a boldness all the same, due to its lighting configurations unlikely to ever occur in real life, set under a sky too dark to really be supporting any. And it's also just a odd setting in general as well. Ancient Japan buildings in a dry, empty desert with mountains, dead trees, and more scaffolding, traffic signs, shipping containers, and corrugated steel-built slum housing than any actual roads or humane-seeming accommodations. How are these textures so moist? The vibe so foggy, yet the land so dry. It doesn't feel as if a real place. There's no temperature to intuit, no season to gauge, and a fuck of a whole lot of potential weird shit lying in obfuscated wait. Hence why, indeed similar to Siren, you have the ability to see through your enemies' as eyes in order to figure out where and what they're up to so that one may stealth around them. In what are, in essence, MGS-style guard pattern -y situations. Though, oh fuck man, this shit's fucking scary. The audio mix is again a little raw to be sure, but in some ways that almost makes it works in its favor. You see, in Siren, the sidejacking is sort of VHS-y, but in Atama it's fleshy, weird, bone crackly, paired with heartbeats and a pulsating bassy synth. It feels gross and unpleasantly confronting. Like, 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 listen to the fucking sounds of this shit. Amplified by the fact that the enemies here are statically floating, looming, all-seeing. <coughs> Giant 
heads. That's, that's so weird. So untraditional. So... I cannot gauge what the fuck this is going to do when it gets me that it had me legitimately fucking terrified. And so I won't say what the fuck they do either. Fuck you, bitch. <laughs> oh yeah, it's so much creepier here in my opinion. It's not just a visual MGS cone, it's this naked, unmuddied confrontation of your very mobile fears. Because I don't find the regular shmegala sorta zombies of sirens scary, per se. You can shoot them, and they can shoot you. I know what to expect. But in Atama, I genuinely do not. I know where it is, but that is all I know. That's a scary position to be in. Naturally, obviously, things will wear out a little as the game goes on, as it unavoidably does. However, I think what is most powerful about Atama's gameplay is that when you stealth successfully using the vision shit to map out who is where to be able to avoid them, you, in many cases, don't even get to see some of the enemies. Uh, there's a thing, it sounds like a baby in a hut with an axe. And I never fucking saw what it looked like. Cause fuck peeking in there, I know where it is, I ain't going near that shit. And, and, and then they make you grab the axe. And I still didn't fucking see it. I wasn't gonna tempt that shit, I was scared as fuck. I dinged that bell, saw that fucker see that shit and snuck in stiff as dicks as a bitch and grabbed that hoe. I mean axe. I mean bitch. Shit. And it even does a pretty decent job of building upon this formula with a different setup, if you will, for each area. One can be distracting them based, another can be blocking them off based, or one can throw you for a loop entirely and thus it avoids the spoiling of the spooks. More or less, all horror eventually falls into, and that's fucking genius. Such a much a cooler use of this idea than I think Siren never did, if you ask me, and I like Siren, but <laughs> this fucking owns. The Steam page claims a new spin on horror, and I'm always a bit skep when I see shit like that, but nah, I think they actually did something really significant here in regards to player x enemy engagement within a horror setting. Isn't to say that I don't have some issues. Level design can be very large with a lot of heads to take note off at once, which to me sometimes felt a little confusing and thus difficult in a way that made me feel headless. But then the piecing together of the mental map is it not satisfying neither, so I can defo see this being a draw just as much so as a drawback. Regardless, in between the bizarre visuals, the mentally gory nature of the gameplay, the abstractness of the entire situation, and the loud obscureness of the sound design, confronting obfuscation will be the term that I will label this game with. And as such, I don't want to say much more about it, because I feel like knowing as little as possible is quite essential to what it does. It's tale time! Indeed, Gex Gutsa. A tale about Kamiwaza, Way of the Thief. A PS2, now 4 game made by Acquire, whom are also responsible for the Way of the Samurai series. So, as the title implies, Kamiwaza is a tentative spin off. Tentative, as as far as I can tell, in Japan it's not subtitled that way, but then the format is verily similar, so it may as well have been being one of cute, Japanese-style open district RPG tonages with shops, sites, vibes, folks to talk to, and quests to take. RPG mechanics with food, gear, levels, and a little bit of input on how the story progresses and a heaping heap of goofy bullshit. <laughs> Good luck. Wonderful. Mm. Understand? <laughs> Only because this is Way of the Thief and not Samurai, you don't have a in-depth battle system with kinda random encounters and kinda dungeons, as instead, there's Tenchu-esque. Which is also a series made by Acquire. Not from software, stop saying that! Little sneak zones for thieving, peeving, and stealing. Thing is, Ebizo and his bro infiltrated a house so that the latter can give the former his rookie thief tutorial until bro gets left behind as Ebizo inadvertently ends up kidnapping a child whom he then ends up taking care of for several years, but then the child is sick now, thus requiring a man to crime his way towards a cure and money to save. And right off of the rouge, I have to point out that whatever you think a stealth game is, or how a stealth game works isn't exactly going to apply. What does apply is a few PS2-isms, camera clunk, thin story, often repetitive design sound bites. it be what it be, but what be the case be that we can essentially just walk around guys. 
Jesus. None of those fancy silhouetted see-through wall shenanigans or detailed maps or other types of indicators. Uh, nah, it's just straight on by. You can be out here football kicking your bag at shit to knock it off the walls and beating up the furniture like an asshole, loudly snatching whole meals off of the dinner tables and in literally the next room with an open door and paper thin walls there can be a dude there who will not give a singular fuck. As you see, this is more so a action game where sneaking is the combos instead of fighting. For example, you steal by beating motherfuckers up. You slip by them by combo chaining dash parries that can also link up into one hit steals otherwise having to seal the steal deal with a health bar. Audio matters nearly dick fuck all with you being able to frequently run and jump around like it's nothing and of course what matters most in stealth is DMC style style points. It's like a goofy for sure but it fits a game where you snatch objects by the dozens as your backpack slowly fills up to cartoonish sizes all the while the OST blasts away Black Sabbath style. Actually, that's something I want to point out too. A key vibe feature of the way of the series is the way the series handled its music. Using mixings of traditional Japanese instruments, jazzy, funky acoustic guitars and flourishes of Baroque. You were hearing it up until just now in the background. It's always suited the colonialist Japan setting to a T, as well as the laid back nature of the story's tones. But here we are sneaking, stealing, breaking the law and getting rap sheets. Thus, thusly, there's traditional Japanese instruments paired up with heavy Black Sabbathian rock guitars, breakdowns and bassy, groovy, dubby hip-hop beatwork with even some samples. Which absolutely does not put one in the mood to take it slow or cautiously. If there's anything here though that is absolutely like the rest of the series, it is that Kamiwaza doesn't explain any of its intricacies at all. And even when it does, it can still be hard to find out what leads to what and why. I mean, here's what happened to me when I first hit up the town, right? Right away, everyone was running away from me, scared ass. I could enter the shop marked on the map, but there was no shopkeep. Random guys then tried killing me and it said not to wear your disguise cause that makes you look sus and so I didn't. But then the fat ass bag also does, which I had, but it couldn't go to the store where I thought I had to desus my sack. It's a very open game. The town lets you do whatever the hell you want. Enter buildings, kill people, steal things at any time, and so much of it can come back to haunt you in many, many different ways. Only other game in this series I've played is Way of the Sam 4, and while I love that title for a ton of reasons, I've also never been able to actually finish it due to so many things leading to so many things. Crucial NPCs going away, dying, not liking you, missing random events or items crucial for ending conditions, or even even so much as just taking too long to do a thing or doing a thing but doing it in the wrong way or at the wrong time is enough to end up bad ending, which you most likely will on your first playthrough. And your second. Maybe even third. And Thief is exactly the same that way. It's not a bad thing in my eyes, it's part of the lol so random charm, but at the same time I can also see it driving anyone with a stronger scent of completely necessity completely up the fucking wall. Like, while Waza tells you that it has a notoriety system, i.e. if you get caught with your face on full blast that might make a bitch notorious, which is why everyone hated me, but it doesn't tell you how to lower said notoriety, how to deal with being hated, what goes away or doesn't, is the shop simply closed at this time or can't I shop because I'm hated? What does this icon mean? And then that's all like steal the wanted signs because they look too much like you and so I do even though I can't because my bag is full and I don't know how to empty it yet and it also didn't help because people are still scared of me because I'm stealing fucking signs. Now naturally eventually I found my way. I learned where the thief's guild was, where you can empty your bag, learn new skills, buy new disguises, and so on. But I say all of this to highlight that you will be feeling confused a lot. 
but also that that's okay. Fuck around and find out is quite literally how they want you to play. Playing through it many times to do exactly that in many different ways. Yeah, sure, the child will probably die on your first run, but that's fine by me because I had a cat in my inventory. Painstakingly beat up a whole room full of science, which took me several minutes. <laughs> Several minutes. Broke into their rich people's house, put a bunch of pagodas in the poor people box, and then got arrested in front of my dying daughter whom I kidnapped. End credits. That was basically my first run. A whopping three hours of failure, game overing so hard that the game fucking ended on me. Ew, fucking bastard. Them two went a fuck of a whole lot better though. Mastering the stealth dodge chain combo shit so I was snatching easier and zooming past motherfuckers at hyper speed. I also stayed masked up so that I didn't instantly turn myself into a pariah and made sure not to steal literally everything as an autumn big in my sack to dummy degrees. In town, I went straight to the objectives, didn't waste my precious time on sleeping, managed my money better and actually got my shit going. Finally, being able to peacefully explore the town and do my business, donate things to the people to make them like me more and not being such a broke ass that I had to resort to blatant daytime public crimages. See? I'm helping people. Love just being able to take in the vibe now too. Admiring the fact that it is such a elegant remastering. Only upscaling the revolution, widening the aspect ratio and remaking UI assets to be sharper. Perfectly preserving the cool painterly art style reminds me of how Quite On looked, or as if a less heavily shaded Okami. Boasting big beefy textures, making textures look painted and models as if little paper craft figurines. What with the cute 2D flourishes on hair, the legit gorgeous snowy flower bushes, and the boldly red and yellow autumn trees. The juice of color is cool in general, to be honest. The dark turquoise in sky, the great wooden buildings with hints of deep blues, and the cool willowy trees running alongside the beautiful it defo didn't look this nice on ps2 reflective moats there's also brown tumultuous clouds at the beach with brightly textured flowers briskly swaying in the wind and a cool marketplace with opulent red curtained buildings and a comfy mountainside path it's generally a really chill place to be in and because people didn't hate me now i'd actually spot more of the casual goings on around town as well like a little side drama around fish supplies that then resulted in side quests. Sadly, because of the obscure nature of the game's mechanics, it can still be very easy to accidentally do something bad. Entering stores just looking around? No. And before I knew it, I was seen as the villain once again, which is just fucking unfair. No one's seen me do shit just because I did it doesn't mean you can just assume that, bitch. It's fucked up. Can't even be a fucking criminal in peace anymore. Goddamn. The meta of the game, though, essentially is kind of like min-maxing notoriety, I guess. If your back's too big, that's sus. So wear a mask when big back. If you're donating shit to people, no mask always. But also, don't think just because you're not actively doing anything weird that you can't get marked down for it either. So, masking when trying new shits usually isn't a bad idea, nor is waiting until nightfall. You can also hear what the townsfolk think about you, whether they know you're a thief but in a Robin Hood sense, whether they're scared or simply suspicious of no one in particular yet, or whatever. Wanted signs also show what the guards think you look like, based on how well you've been disguising, and when Max wanted, do not go home, that's when you get arrested. Otherwise, you're good to go though. Obviously, if you don't go home at all, the child will die, which is the whole push and pull of what we got going down. Trying to get away with doing fuck shit while trying to make the fuck shit work in your favor as much as possible. Which is really not easy, but there's still a lot of fun to be had in that too. Some in really just clicked when I masked up, entered a house, stole some shit, and then jumped up off out of the roof from a balcony with no one having seen me do shit. Explore, stumble into things, and see what happens. Really, my overarching issue with the game isn't its fault at all, it's because its position within a series. They tend to evolve and develop, after all. WOS 4 for PS3 and 360 for instance, has an engaging story. With a memorable cast, an amazing setting, and a fair bit of direction aided by all of the above. Which Kamiwaza simply doesn't have. Well, the cool world is there, but the map isn't designed as tightly, and the story is paper thin, and the characters really ain't shit. 
no Mega Melons, no Jet Jenkins, no whatever this shit was, what happened to me and my friend Gil on stream once. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. Of course it doesn't have that. That's what 3 and especially 4 introduced. This dropped before 3. So of course it dropped before 4 2 as it dropped after 2. I had my fun with it certainly, but... Honestly, if you like what you see here, it might legit be worth playing for first if you haven't. It's on Steam and shit. Very easy to get. And if you like that, including its more obtuse elements, then this is defo worth a shot. But playing it raw, I think, is harder to recommend. Though who knows, maybe this video can serve as a little beginner's guide. Play it fast, play it masked, and roll with the punches, knowing to avoid some next time. Would be a good mantra for Kamiwaza, Way of the Thief. Kamiwaza, Way of the Thief.